was Charles Bosserin Chambers. And what's the connection between Edward Bach, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, and Maxfield Parrish? Stay tuned, you're about to find out. There's an old curiosity shop. Well, hi everyone, I'm Scott from the Old Curiosity Shop. And less than two weeks ago, I was schlepping around in a this and that store, not too far from where I live. And I stumbled upon a couple of antique religious prints, one I'll talk about later. But the one I want to show you today is this image here. Now, this is not uh, a discussion about how people feel one way or the other about religious prints. Let's just not get into that. Um, I like this print and the other one that I purchased. Well, let's take a look at it and I'll try to show it to you without there being too much glare on it. We can see it's a sepia print that's got a little bit of coloring done to it. And it's in a lovely period frame close up on that. Uh, and uh, it is signed, meaning that just in ink, it's printed as part of the print itself, um, the name of the author, uh, the artist rather, and a little bit about, uh, well, and the publishing company. Now, I must admit, I had to go and look up some information, and I'm going to read off of my little secret white paper here. I wasn't familiar with the work of Charles Bosseron Chambers, but he's known as the uh, Rembrandt of, I'm sorry, um, the Rembrandt or the Norman Rockwell um, of Catholic art or Christian art, uh, religious artwork. And you're all familiar, even if you didn't know it, with this image right here. I understand that is the most widely reproduced uh, religious print. I'm just going to use the word religious here. I guess I should say Christian print uh, in existence. Uh, this is all over the place. But a much lesser known work by the artist is this one right here entitled The Return. Now let's see what it says about this beautiful image, The Return. And I guess I'll put, let me slide over here and we'll put a picture of it right here so you can look at it while I'm reading this to you. According to a, according to a popular account, one day Chambers stopped by the Church of the Holy Innocents on 37th Street for Mass. Here's a picture of the church. It's still there in Lower Manhattan. Afterwards, he observed a young man praying before a life-size crucifix and immediately made a quick sketch. In later speaking to the man, Chambers learned that he was a Frenchman who had drifted away from religion since coming to New York, but was now heading back to fight in World War I and had prayed for a return to the faith. Chambers produced an oil painting from that sketch. And now uh, this is um, taken uh, from the American Art News, which was contemporary to the time this was done, which World War I, we're talking 1914, 15, 16. According to the American Art News, quote, his remarkable picture, The Return, which shows a soldier at the foot of a crucifix and enveloped in a certain divine mystery and depths of sentiment, compelling and convincing, has been reproduced by one of the largest publishing companies in color and sepia, and having decided success, unquote. We're going to get to that publishing company in a minute. In fact, we're going to walk down there. Now, after the war, Chambers was later able to make contact with the soldier who told him that having survived the war, he had entered a monastery. 
The refurbished crucifix, now ter termed the return crucifix, is still at Holy Innocence, located in the right rear corner of the church. Again, here's the church. There is also a stained glass rendition of Charles' painting in the choir loft. I didn't know all of that history, but when I bought this print, I looked down here and I saw the Curtis Publishing Company. Now I have to tell you this, here's a little caveat or sideline. I knew that the Curtis Publish Co Publishing Company was here in Philadelphia, that, it had a, had, that Edward Bach was the editor for many years, the Ladies' Home Journal, all of that, and Mrs. Curtis, who founded the Curtis Institute of Music here in Philadelphia, knew all that history. I didn't know that they actually published uh, or produced lithographs, prints, and things at that time, but I, since it says the, publish, the Curtis and Publishing Company here, I guess there's no other Curtis, Curtis Publishing Company, and indeed, it was uh, printed here in Philadelphia. Anyway, what we're going to do now is take a walk down to the Curtis building, which is no longer a house of publications. There's restaurants in there, office space, even luxury condos. It's a beautiful building in the, well, the Beaux-Arts or the Georgian Revival style. And it's just a few blocks from here. But what I want to show you is on the inside. Now, I said there is a connection between Maxfield Parish and Lewis Comfort, Tif Lewis Comfort Tiffany. What's that got to do with that building? Let's go see. Well, I've just left my home and a uh, two minute walk brings me to the heart of Chinatown on our way to the Curtis Publishing Building. But I've got to stop and get a cup of coffee. And since you've already seen and heard me talk about Philadelphia's Chinatown before, I don't think I'll do too, too much filming here. It is early in the morning and it is quiet. So you don't see too much hustle and bustle yet. But the markets will soon open. Okay, leaving Chinatown, we're about to cross onto Market Street and the downtown Center City Shopping District of Philadelphia. Let's go. Well, it was right here at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, also known as PAFA, where Maxfield Parish studied art for a while and perhaps received his inspiration to create the beautiful piece of art we're about to enjoy. It's a nice old building. It's the oldest... Sorry, that's the train <laughs> underground. I'm standing over top of it. Let it go by. It's actually the Broad Street Line, the subway, but here in Philly we just call it the train. Anyway, the oldest arts academy in the United States. And there it stands. The journey continues. <laughs> Stay tuned. Well, there is a nice Starbucks in the ground level of this building, but since I don't like paying $5 for a cup of coffee, I'll pass. However, what a beautiful old building. It's condos now. I paid one dollar. And it's the best coffee you'll ever have. Mm-hmm. I love it. Well, that's the grand old Ben Franklin Hotel. You don't see too many like that in American cities anymore. Most of them have been torn down. But this beautiful old thing is still here. It's condos. I've got friends that live close to the top floor. 
And the lobby and ballrooms are absolutely still very stunning, as you can imagine. So it's nice to know that it's still there. The great big old sign on the top, which we can't really see. Anyway, straight ahead through the streets there is the top of the old Curtis and Publishing Company. That's where we're headed. And we're gonna see the beautiful surprise that a lot of folks don't know exists right inside of that building. I can't wait. I hope you're excited. Well, we're now looking at a street called S-A-N-S-O-M, the famous Jewelers Row. And millions of engagement and wedding rings were purchased on this street for well over a hundred years. It's the diamond district, if you will. And once again, looming overhead, in the back, we see the Curtis Building. I'm really building this up, aren't I? Well, it's worth it. Let's keep traveling, and I just can't wait. I can't give you anything but love, baby. That's the only thing I'm plenty of, baby. Dream a while, dream a while, we're sure to find happiness. And I guess all those things you always find for me, I'd like to see you looking well. Baby, diamond bracelets will work out and sell. Baby, till that lucky day you know darn well. Baby, I can't give you anything but love. Well, there she is, the Curtis Publishing Company, now just known as the Curtis Building, as the publishing company is no longer in the hands of the Curtis family. I'm on the quiet south side of the building, I'm sorry, 7th Street side of the building, and it's so massive it takes up an entire city block and I can't even get the whole thing in my camera. Now we're going to go around to the entrance, the main entrance, which is on uh, 6th Street. And hold your breath and get ready. You're gonna love it. Well, I still don't understand. He's dragging us all around, showing us a bunch of dumb old buildings. What's in this Curtis Publishing building anyway? Well, I am taking you to see Dream Garden, an enormous glass mosaic designed by artist Maxfield Parrish and executed by Louis Comfort Tiffany for the lobby of the Curtis Publishing Building in Philadelphia, home of the successful magazines The Ladies' Home Journal and The Saturday Evening Post, just to name a few. The work was commissioned by Edward Bach, senior editor of the Curtis Publishing Company. That's who you're looking at right now. Over a one-month period prior to being installed in the Curtis Building, the work was exhibited at Tiffany Studios in New York City, attracting more than 7,000 admirers and garnering widespread critical acclaim. The Dream Garden took six months to install in its home in Philadelphia. Multi-talented Maxfield Parrish, seen here, was known as a master of make-believe. Charming readers with illustrations for children's books and magazine covers. Parrish's method of alternating transparent oils with varnish added to the illusion of light to his landscapes. And I'm going to insert right here an image of his most famous print, and it was once estimated that about one in every four American homes had this image hanging somewhere on the walls in their home, circa 1922. Now back to the Dream Garden. Measuring 15 by 49 feet, Dream Garden was produced by the Tiffany Studios in 1916 using over 100,000 pieces of Favril glass. Yes, that's that beautiful iridescent glass that I'm always hunting for when I go to the Goodwill. In June of 1998, the Dream Garden was sold to a casino owner. And it was going to be ripped out of the Curtis building in Philadelphia. 
But alas, alack, the Philadelphians would not have it. A great deal of money was raised and much contributed by the Pew Charitable Trust Foundation, which saved the work, and it remains in Philadelphia and is now owned by, happily, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where Maxfield Parish studied many, many, many years ago. So, the Dream Garden still dominates the lobby of the Curtis Center. It's feet away from Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell, and anyone who visits Philadelphia should cross Fifth Street into the lobby of the beautiful Curtis Building, and there it is. And that's exactly what we're about to do right now.
way home, I've got to stop at the old Reading Terminal Market and go to my favorite candy shop. This old market has been here for well over 150 years. And every once in a while, I have got to stop and take a look at the wonderful display and the variety of licorice. And I think today, rather than bridge mix, I'm going to settle for licorice cats. How about that? Mm-hmm. I love black licorice. Well, thank you for joining me, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed the collaboration between Lewis Comfort Tiffany, Edward Bach, and Maxfield Parrish. And if you ever get to Philadelphia, when you go and you visit the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall, don't forget the old Curtis Publishing Building is right across the street, just across 6th Street and up the steps, and there it is. If you enjoyed it, Give this video a thumbs up, won't you, and leave me a comment. That will encourage me to produce more videos just like this. Now, should I get some Turkish taffy as well? Hmm.